and finally the local point. I am sure if you listen carefully and you try to combine after the site event what you are listening, you can learn a lot. Initially, looking at from the global level and perspective, the group of governance on climate change of Universitat Politécnica de Catalunya with Albert Turón and Olga Alcaraz. Olga Alcaraz is the director of the group. Or, if you want, Olga Alcaraz and Albert Turón as speakers will present us the recent results of their research under the title Equity Based Analysis on the Current NDCs. Albert, Olga, Olga, Albert, you have the floor. Thank you, Josep. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, all we know that climate change is a threat to the future of humankind and also to the future of all living beings in our planet. To reverse climate change is a big challenge but an even bigger challenge is to address the, the great injustice that climate change implies. This study we present uh, aims to be a modest contribution to a fair implementation of the Paris Agreement. Please, if you can, okay. Well, the contents of this presentation are as follows. We will start explaining the objectives of our work. After, we will make a short introduction to some key concepts. Then, we present the results of our assessment on the cumulative emissions implied by the current indices. And we will continue presenting our analysis based on equity of the current indices. At the end, we will make some final remarks. Well, the work we are presenting has two main objectives. Firstly, to do an analysis of the level of ambition of the current indices. This analysis has been done by assessing the consumption of the global carbon budget that the whole of the current indices imply. Secondly, to make an equity-based study on the distribution among different groups of countries of the cumulative emissions that NDCs implies from 2020 to 2030. In this study, we calculate cumulative emissions and we compare with the global carbon budget. The global carbon budget is a key concept that links the cumulative carbon dioxide emissions we release over the time with the temperature increase these emissions will cause. When we talk about the remaining carbon budget, we are referring to the total quantity of carbon dioxide emissions or cumulative emissions that could still be emitted while keeping warming below a specific temperature level. Moreover, from the sixth assessment report, we know that the remaining carbon budget compatible with the 1.5 degrees goal amounts to only 400 gigatons of carbon dioxide. So, one way of measuring ambition at a global level is to measure the rate of consumption of this global carbon budget. And it is worrying to see how quickly we are consuming this budget. In fact, we are emitting around 42 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. Referring to the nationally determined contributions, we all know that they are the building blocks 
of the Paris Agreement, and that according to the Paris Rulebook, parties have to explain how they consider that their NDC is unfair and ambitious. And when we, are, when we talk about ambition in mitigation, we talk about how far we are to the Paris Agreement temperature goal. Here we present an estimate of the cumulative carbon dioxide emissions that will be released into the atmosphere between 2020 and 2030, according to the emission mitigation objectives from the NDCs. The result is that the current NDCs will imply an overall of 401 gigatons of carbon dioxide. But in order to analyze how far we are from the 1.5 goal, we also have to consider the emissions from international civil aviation. ICAO is committed to achieve carbon neutral growth from 2020. And according to this commitment, by 2030, they will have released around seven gigatons of carbon dioxide. Also, we consider the commitment of the International Maritime Organization of reducing emissions by 50% in 2050 with respect to the 2008 level. According to this commitment, the International Maritime Navigation will have released by 2030 seven gigatons of carbon dioxide. In other words, the emission mitigation strategies currently on the table let, at, let, let us to a total cumulative emissions of 415 gigatons of carbon dioxide. This allows us to affirm that by 2030, humanity will have not only exhausted, but even exceeded by 15 gigatons, the global carbon budget compatible with limiting the increase of temperature to 1.5 degrees. If we do not initiate drastic emission reductions immediately and we postpone action until 2030, then we will never achieve the 1.5 degrees temperature stabilization target. But now I will pass the floor to my colleague, Albert Duron. But uh, uh, first, I, I would like to explain some key concepts around equity in mitigation. In relation to mitigation, the fifth assessment report of the IPCC identifies four main dimensions of equity. The first one is the dimension of equality. The principle of equality based on the fact that all inhabitants of the planet are equal. In relation to mitigation is usually specified to mean having the same number of emissions per capita. The principle of responsibility in accordance with the idea that it is necessary to compensate for the damage caused is transferred to mitigation, calling upon those countries that have historically had higher emissions per capita to be the ones that lead the mitigation of set emissions. The capacity principle, based on the idea of distributive justice, is interpreted to be counting the economic capacity to face climate change mitigation and adaptation measures. The fourth principle, it's a very important principle, is the right to sustainable development, which aims to preserve the atmospheric space still available for those sustainable development initiatives that are so necessary and are still pending in some countries of the world. Well, 
Albert, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Olga. Um, the second results that we are showing uh, here today are those uh, from an equity-based uh, study on how these uh, 401 gigatons of CO2 are distributed among different uh, groups of countries. Uh, we are classifying all these countries of the world according to some criteria. Uh, first, by their income level, then uh, whether they belong or not to the Annex 1 of the Convention, and finally, uh, geographically. Um, the question that we want to, to ask ourselves today is how can we assess if the current indices are made according to equity criteria? To do so, we are going to look at three different indicators uh, that we can see here. The first one is the, the share of global historical cumulative emissions that each group of countries represents. Uh, the second uh, one is how this amount uh, has changed uh, due to the NDCs, uh, to the NDC application period. And finally, the share of global population that each group of countries uh, represents. Uh, with, this uh, with these three indicators, we are going to assess the equality and responsibility dimensions of equity uh, that Olga just explained, the other two. Uh, which are uh, the capacity and the right to development can be assessed when countries are grouped according to their income level. Uh, those countries with a higher income level are supposed to uh, have a higher capacity and therefore are meant to uh, make more ambitious commitments according to the equity criteria that, that again, Olga just uh, explained to us. Um, and well, here is where the things become a little bit dense. I'll try to make uh, them as smooth as possible, but uh, please keep always in mind that the numbers that we are gonna, going to, to see from now on are not absolute figures, meaning we are not talking about the total emissions or the total population uh, of each group of countries, but we are uh, talking about the share that each group represents uh, from the total. Okay, um, now let me explain how do we assess these indicators. Um, first, when we look at the second column and the, and the third, be, meaning the, the cumulative emissions of the NDC period and the share of the population, uh, we can assess the the equality of the, of the NDCs. For NDC to be equal, uh, the share of cumulative emissions of the NDCs period should be similar to the share of their population, as the equality criteria seeks an equal emissions per capita for all the inhabitants in the world. Yes. Uh, when we look at the first and the second column, uh, we can appreciate the change of the tendency of cumulative emission due to the NDCs. A lower share in the future emissions should mean that this group of countries is declining uh, these emissions and vice versa. Uh, then, when we look at the first and third column, we can determine the historical emissions per capita of every group. With this, we get a sense uh, about how unequal the historical emissions have been. And finally, we can assess if the responsibility criteria has been reflected at some degree in the NDCs, if the relation between emissions and population has changed. A group of countries is offering uh, some historical compensation if their share of historical emissions is higher than um, is higher than the share of population. So what we're seeing in the gray area. Uh, uh, and if in the NDC period uh, is the other way around, meaning uh, this relation of, of here, the, the tendency has changed. So the, the share of population is now higher than the share of uh, cumulative emissions. Uh, this means that there has been uh, some historical, historical compensation. 
Likewise, uh, those countries whose historical emissions were lower than population uh, in the past, but in the 2030 period, uh, their emissions are higher than their population, are getting some of this uh, compensation, historical compensation back. Okay, with all that being said, uh, let's start to see the, finally the, the results. First, uh, as I said, we are uh, going to, um, to assess the grouping with respect to the income level of the, of the countries. Let's start from the top with the uh, high income countries, which here we see in, in color yellow. Uh, and we can see that these countries, which uh, we'll know that uh, have in this group countries like United States, uh, the European Union, Japan, uh, contain uh, more or less the 15% of the current uh, world population, but take more than a quarter of the cumulative emissions in the NDC period, uh, which is not compatible with the principle of equality. Let alone with the principle of responsibility, because the, these countries have uh, uh, been responsible for more than 40% of the cumulative historical emissions, so it cannot be said that the current NDCs address the responsibility dimension either. Uh, then, with the upper middle income, here in grey, countries like China, uh, South Africa, or Brazil, uh, we can uh, follow, uh, or we can see how it follows a similar pattern as the high income countries, although the percentage uh, differences between the different columns are lower, uh, but nevertheless, they neither achieve the quality principle nor the responsibility. And finally, for the lower middle income countries, countries like uh, India, Indonesia, Iran, and low income countries like Sudan or, or Afghanistan, uh, the situation is antagonistic to the one that we just saw. Um, these country groups contain more than half of the world population uh, right now, but uh, their emissions uh, are only a 30% of, of, the, of the world uh, emissions in the NDC period. Uh, and all that having a clear, uh, a clear deficit in the cumulative emissions, because in the historical period they had uh, even lower emissions. Uh, well, excuse me. <laughs> no, no. Uh, well, uh, what we can see with the grouping by income of the, of the, of, of the countries in the world is that uh, we cannot say that the, um, that the NDCs are uh, made in the light of equity because they do not respond to the uh, equality, neither the responsibility criteria. Yeah, now you can then uh, let's assess the second grouping that we that we are analyzing today, and this is the non-Annex 1 versus Annex 1 countries, which we all know that it's the way of the climate convention to speak about developing and developed countries. And here we can see a, a trend very similar to the grouping by income level. Uh, when we look at the share of population on non-Annex 1 countries, we can see that um, this is much higher uh, than the than the historical emissions. They have a much higher population than emissions. And uh, despite getting a bit closer to, to its share, uh, to this share, sorry, uh, in the NDC period, it's still not enough. Uh, and then when we see the Annex 1 countries uh, have been emitting much higher, uh, historically, a uh, much higher share of emissions than their population, so we cannot say either than looking at this distribution and this is done in the light of, of equity. And finally, we get to the last grouping, and uh, I'm finishing here, uh, which is the, the grouping by geographic, geographic distribution. Here we are seeing uh, more variety of, of situations. We'll start with the uh, 
uh, North American and uh, Oceania countries, uh, which have a very similar situation that one with the high income countries. Um, the equity criteria is not met because uh, according to their NDCs, their emissions per capita are still way over than the world average. At the same time, uh, Africa's provision of emission is way under their population. So they should still have some carbon uh, space disponible. This is even more worrying because uh, their NDC emissions uh, are almost the same as the historical ones, so we don't, we don't see an evolution here. Uh, where we do actually appreciate some historical compensation is in the uh, Latin American countries, uh, coming from a situation in which uh, the share of uh, historical emissions is 1.3% percent higher than their population um, with the NDC, in the NDC period, with the application of the NDCs, uh, this uh, situation uh, reverts and then we have a lower, um, a lower emissions uh, share than the population one. So this is the condition that earlier we explained to assess the um, historical compensation. So we can say that uh, Latin American countries and this are both uh, uh, both meet both the criteria of uh, quality and responsibility uh, then if we uh, speak of Europe we have a similar behavior but in this case the historical compensation is very small and in our opinion not enough uh, for talking uh, or taking into account the, the huge difference between the historical emissions and their population. Uh, so we can say that the equality criteria is met because in the future period they have a really similar number, but not the responsibility because again, the difference is still uh, too low. And uh, finally, uh, with, we are finalizing with, with uh, Asia. Um, Asia is the region, the region that uh, receives some of these historical compensation. Its cumulative emissions in the NDC period are a bit higher than their share of population, um, where historically the emissions were uh, lower. So again, we can say that Asia complies with the equity and responsibility criteria. And with that, uh, I've ended. I pass the floor to, again to Olga for the final remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Albert. Well, we are arriving to the end of this presentation. As uh, you have seen, in the 2020-2030 period, the share of carbon space used by the most developed countries decreases when compared to that use between the historical period. But despite of this, a compensation for the poorest countries in accordance with their, de their development needs, historical responsibilities, and their population is not <coughs> achieved. The cumulative emissions implied by the indices of lower middle and low mid income countries which make up more than a half of the world population, only represent the 30% of the global cumulative emissions until 2030. This could seriously affect their development, considering the lack of some basic infrastructures and also the adaptation challenges that these countries have to face. It is clear for us that in order to meet the Paris Agreement mitigation objective, the current NDC should be revised by increasing their level of ambition. This revision should also be done in the light of equity. And in this revision, the poorest countries could increase the carbon space they use in order to meet their development needs. In an hypothetic call for revision of the current indices, the total amount of the cumulative emissions, the aggregate effect of indices will imply, 
must be reduced about 45%, but not a 45% for everyone. According to equity, developed countries must reduce the share of the carbon space they are talking by more than 45, whilst developing countries could increase it. It is very important that a sufficient share of the remaining carbon budget remains at the disposal of developing countries to guarantee their right to development. Well, that's all for our side. Thanks for your attention. And if you have some questions, you can write an email uh, here and we will answer as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And you are uh, really uh, uh, just to the time that you have, so I appreciate very much your cooperation for the good running of the event. Well, secondly, is the turn of the national level and perspective. We have been the global perspective from the point of view that you listen. Now we move the scale and we move with the climate scorecard of action. The speakers will be Pablo David Necoechea Porras from Mexico and Ron Israel, the climate scorecard co-founder from United States. Unfortunately, they cannot stay with us in life, but uh, we follow the interesting views thanks to videos that we see now in which they will talk us and I am sure that they are uh, looking at us from the YouTube and so on. So hi, Pablo. Hi, Ron. You are also here from us. Throw your voice. So we can put the first video. Hello. My name is Ron Israel. I'm the director of Climate Scorecard. We're a five-year-old initiative to monitor and report and advocate for policies to reduce emissions in leading greenhouse gas emitting countries around the world. We also coordinate a climate commitments campaign to ascertain the degree to which countries around the world can make policy commitments to achieve the following goals. First, commit to reduce emissions by 50% by the year 2030. Second, have a plan for doing that. Third, commit to becoming carbon neutral by 2050 and have a plan for doing that. And finally, to include these other four commitments in an updated Paris Agreement NDC pledge. In 2015, we did an assessment of the pledges that countries originally made to the Paris Agreement and concluded that those pledges were too low to prevent the planet from warming beyond what used to be the two degrees Celsius global warming tipping point, but now has been revised downward, thanks to the IPCC report, to 1.5 degrees. Now, six years later, uh, in accordance with the Paris Agreement, countries are submitting new updated Paris Agreement pledges, but it seems as if very little has changed. While a few countries 
have made commitments to at least a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030. Most have not come close to that. And even the countries that have made those robust commitments still face problems in implementing their updated pledges. So why is this? What are the obstacles, challenges, preventing countries from fully committing to our five climate commitment goals? There are at least four broad reasons. First, politics. Countries lack, lack the political leadership and will. Many have constituencies for who climate change is not a priority. Others have the political will at a national level, but can't get their regions and states and communities that have different interests to join in. Second, economic reasons. Many countries are torn between making commitments to climate mitigation and the need to feed, clothe, and house their growing population. Third, resource commitments. Many countries lack the financial um, and technological resources needed to make uh, the policy changes that are required. Fourth, accountability. Most countries lack a focal point, a political body, a person who can be held accountable for ensuring that their countries reduce their emissions and fulfill their Paris Agreement pledges. Each month, Climate Scorecard publishes a report that analyzes the ways in which the countries we follow are addressing the challenges involved in making effective climate commitments. Last summer, in one of our reports, we asked our country managers to identify the biggest obstacles their countries faced in reducing emissions. Here's what some of them said. For example, Brazil, which has pledged a 40% reduction in emissions by 2030, it has no plan for doing so, has been constrained by its government's hands-off policy towards environmental regulation, and its pro-development policy, for example, taking land away from indigenous people and giving it to mining interests, letting large parts of the Amazon be clear cut for agriculture. China, which has the low level goal of peaking emissions by 2030, deals with the split between national policies, some of which are quite strong uh, in terms of mitigating emissions and policies at the local level, concerned about providing jobs and energy for citizens. India, which has made recently a pledge to become carbon neutral by 2070, but lacks the resources to mitigate climate change that it claims are owed to it by developed countries who shoulder the major responsibility for letting CO2, CO2 emit into the atmosphere. <clears throat> the United Kingdom, which has an ambitious goal of reducing emissions by 68%, but has not taken into, the, into account the need to change uh, mitigation mechanisms that take place at the household level that give rise to huge bursts of CO2 into the atmosphere. And the United States, my country, which has the goal of reducing emissions by 50 to 55 percent by 2030, but is letting politics stand in the way 
of getting there. She faces a divided Congress and so far has not passed President Biden's uh, climate agenda legislation. And it faces states that really don't believe in the seriousness of climate change and don't want to deal with it as an issue. So what do we do about all this? First of all, it's important to remember the factor of, a very important factor of people power, especially in democracies at the ballot box where people can cast votes in favor of climate change leaders and policies and always in every country in the streets in forms, form of political protests. Secondly, um, we need to stress the need that policies, climate change policies and development policies are not polar opposites. They can be and should be in every country wherever possible made to be blended, to be integrated that climate change policies need to be put into effect that also support development. Thirdly, we need to support policies that promote a just transition for people who lose their livelihood as a result of climate change policies. For example, people working in fossil fuel industries, and we must promote policies that focus on climate justice and make sure that those who are most affected by climate change, that their needs are addressed. Fourth, we have to deal with the climate finance issue. We have to make sure that countries and international agencies step to the plate and fulfill their commitments to providing adequate climate finance so that lesser developed countries can meet uh, their climate change commitments and goals. And finally, uh, we can't ignore the important factor of communicating with everyone, with policymakers, with citizens, with media people, uh, with, with all major stakeholders, with industry. We need to do a better job at communicating the urgency of the need to take action to address climate change and what each stakeholder can do to take action and make climate change a thing of the past. Thank you very much. For more on Climate Scorecard, visit our website, climatescorecard.org. And I hope you'll have a chance now to view a companion video that has been posted by Climate Scorecard's country manager to Mexico that goes into detail about the challenges that the country of Mexico faces in uh, addressing climate change issues um, and taking action to do so. Thank you very much. I hope you have a good rest of your day and that this COP26 is an incredibly successful event with lots of great outcomes that are gonna make a difference. Thank you, Ron. Bye. Please, the next video with Pablo David Necoechea. Hello for everyone, my name is Pablo, I'm from Mexico, and I'm happy to be here in this important event. And also I'm pleased to share with you my thoughts and opinions regarding the climate situation in Mexico. Many thanks to the Climate Scorecard Initiative for this invitation. Climate Scorecard is an international nonprofit organization that publishes news, reports, and action alerts on the status of the Paris Agreement. Climate Scorecard also identifies and advocates for actions that can lower emissions in leading greenhouse gas emitting countries. 
and Mexico Country Manager in Climate Scorecard Initiative. So today, I'm going to talk about the climate situation in Mexico. I have used some information from several sources, for example, International Energy Agency, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and also I have useful information and data from a project in which I'm collaborating with the regional program, Energy Security and Climate Change in Latin America of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. This project aims to study the relationship between public health and climate change. The results of this project will be published in the following weeks on the website of the regional program, Energy Security and Climate Change in Latin America of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. Regarding the Mexico climate situation, Mexico has shown little interest in reducing emissions and also little interest in updating its Paris Agreement commitments. According to the International Energy Agency, in 2020, Mexico had 319 metric tons of CO2 emissions, representing more than 48% in comparison with 1990. In 2012, Mexico was the first developing country to have a general law on climate change, which recognizes the co-responsibility of the public sector and the society together to act against climate change. This law fostered the right to a healthy environment as a human right and included in the Mexican constitution. In 2015, Mexico was the first developing country to include an adaptation component in its intended nationally determined contributions, NDC, and proposed conditional and unconditional commitments for mitigation and adaptation under the country agreement. Mexico committed to reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by 22% in 2030 and 50% in 2050. In 2019, Mexico published the preliminary basis for an emissions trading system program as a level market instrument to reduce greenhouse gas emissions based on the principle of cap and trade. The government imposed a maximum limit or cap on the total emissions of one or more sectors of the economy, causing some companies in these sectors to hold a permit for each ton of greenhouse gas emissions emitted. However, regarding those efforts, particularly in the LATAM context, however, Mexico in 2020 ratified the Paris Agreement commitments and missed a goal opportunity to increase its climate ambition, as many other countries expanded their targets. Mexico did it. In addition, Mexico has failed to publish progress reports, making it difficult to obtain and track specific data related to the commitments and targets achieved. Additionally, the Mexican energy sector regulations have a few recently. The Mexican Congress presented a reform to add specific provisions intending to reinforce the Federal Electricity Commission, a state-owned company that historically has a monopoly in the electric energy generation through conventional sources, fossil fuels. For many years before energy reforms in 2013 in Mexico, this reform opened the activity to the private sectors and also for the renewables. So this modification establishes a new structure that will reduce the preferences for clean energy generation and consumption. And other incentives si acaba sobrant temps, que fan dono més temps a aquella gent o el grup pregunta in addition, in 2021, the Ministry of the Environment and Natural Resources in Mexico had a budget reduction of 28% in comparison with 2018. 
So it seems that Mexico has no interest in meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. However, due to Mexico's geographic conditions, the country is vulnerable to climate risks. The country should foster laws, guidelines, programs, and measures to decarbonize its energy matrix and also to reinforce compliance with the 2030 targets and the Paris Agreement commitments. Mexico is considered among the countries most vulnerable to climate change, since more than 50%, 15% of the national territory, 68% of its population, and 70% of its GDP are prone to suffer negative consequences by climate change. In addition to those big problems, also Mexico faces significant obstacles in combating climate change and reaching the country's climate commitments of reducing CO2 emissions. For example, Mexico energy policy is not the correct one for the country. And also there is a lack of accountability. There is no political leadership coupled with a lack of environment commitment by the federal government. The necessary monetary resources are not allocated to tackle climate change. The budget is not known. Importance of Mexico obstacles identified Mexico's nationally determined contribution in this year to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is not the consistent with the Paris Agreement goal of reducing global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the temperature in the pre-industrial era. So, Mexico wants to reach its emissions targets unless additional policies are endorsed raising emission reduction targets and reversing the fossil fuel trend and expanding renewable energy. The government has adopted a burning of fossil fuels as the core of its energy policy, an approach to likely to increase the country's emissions. Mexico's strategies that will help overcome climate change obstacles include for example, changing the federal government's energy policy away from favoring fossil fuels towards priorizing clean energy generation and consumption. Also, increasing the ambition of government policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The goal of reducing emissions by 22% by 2030 should be raised to 50% in accordance with the recommendations of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Also, increasing the budget for activities that preserve natural resources, reverse the effects of climate change, and lays the foundation for sustainable development. Lastly, putting in place a carbon tax and incentivizing carbon markets. So, Mexico's energy policy and also climate policy require several legal and institutional adjustments to meet climate commitment goals. In consideration of Mexico's renewable energy potential, the government, the government has opportunity, an opportunity to carry out this shift in the decision making to, pos to the position to need to tackle climate change as an opportunity to reduce emissions and environmental inequalities and produce cleaner energy through decentralized needs. Thank you so much for your attention. It was a great opportunity to be here and to share these thoughts with you. And also I'm happy, I'm really happy to learn from you and also to bring best practices to my country in order to have a better world. Thank you so much, and see you soon. Bye. Thank you, Pablo.
we are going on time. So, uh, finally, in the last part of our site event, we go to the local level and perspective under the common umbrella of all the site events. Of course, after the site event, all of us and all of you should do your own merge from the different perspectives. Now we have this approach to the local level with Asociación Proteger de Argentina uh, that um, they uh, present us with the following speakers. I don't meet all of them, so I can... You could present yourself, please. Sol García, Carolina Díaz, Vivian Lees y Richard Siren, que uh, sí que lo conocemos. And that will present us their local initiative to support indigenous communities in Argentina. All of us have the floor. Thank you, Chair. My name is Vivian Liz Pinero. Good afternoon, everyone. We are here on behalf of Asociación Proteger. Asociación Proteger is an NGO from Argentina that works with indigenous peoples back home. We would like to begin this presentation by listening to the voice of the cacique of an indigenous community from Argentina. We are here today on behalf of this indigenous community. We are here today to bring their voices to COP26. The cacique, the chief of the community, will tell us his names in his own native tongue, the Quam language. Yo me llamo en el idioma Nayetagana. Eh, significa río correntoso. Eh, también tengo un nombre, un nombre de, de Casicasgo, Tonolec. Entonces yo tengo dos nombres, uno de, de Cacique y uno de, de, mi, propio, de mi propio pueblo. Eh, me llamo Nayetagana. In addition, the cacique has a third name, Simon, which was given to him by the national government. To get started, I would like to tell you a little bit about indigenous peoples in Latin America and especially in Argentina. According to the national census in 2010, 2.4% of the Argentinian population identifies as an indigenous person. This proportion is lower than the Latin American average of 8%. There are 39 indigenous peoples groups. The most numerous ones are the Mapuches, followed by the Quam and the Guarani. We can see in this map the geographical location of the indigenous communities in Argentina. We can see that they are located throughout the territory, but we can also observe that they are located in the cities. And this is the topic that we would like to talk about. There has been a great migration of the indigenous peoples from rural areas to the cities. One quarter of the indigenous peoples in Argentina and half of indigenous peoples in Latin America live in cities nowadays. The, the indigenous peoples migrate from rural areas to the cities for a number of reasons. In Latin America, we can mention the dispossession of land, ecological degradation, conflict and violence, and natural disasters. And at the same time, in cities, there is better access to basic services, such as health care and education, and better market opportunities. A large proportion of indigenous peoples living in cities face extreme poverty. 36% of indigenous peoples living in cities inhabit insecure, unsanitary, and highly polluted areas. And at the same time, urban communities 
Indigenous communities have the fastest rate of language loss and face the risk of cultural discontinuity. Why is this important for climate action? Indigenous peoples represent 5% of the global population, but they account for 50% of the extreme poor. And at the same time, they are the stewards of 80% of the world's biodiversity, and they speak 57% of all languages. The indigenous peoples are most impacted by the impacts of climate change because they are more exposed, more vulnerable, and have less adaptive capacity. And at the same time, indigenous peoples' knowledge is a major resource for climate change adaptation, including their holistic view of community and environment. Their understanding of how nature and biodiversity works which has been accumulated over generations, will be lost with the passing of the elders and the migration of youth to city centers. I now pass the floor to Carolina Diaz. Thank you. Asociación Proteger was born in 1994, organized by a group of colleagues. The president of the NGO, Juan Ortiz, descent from the Mapuches, one of the indigenous communities that live in Argentina and Chile. Asociación Proteger is an NGO that works horizontally. All the work is on base voluntary. There are no paid positions. As a volunteer, you can join the organization and bring your ideas for starting new projects to work with the many indigenous communities in Argentina. This NGO is a great platform to join in if you'd like to have a positive impact on the community. From the beginning, Asociación Proteger has been working on projects that are transversally linked with nature, sustainability, looking at the three pillars of environment, social, and economy. The following map shows the indigenous community where the association has carried out its most significant action. In Misiones, Comunidad de Cuambia, Guarani Community. In Formosa, Comunidad Primavera, Toba Community. And in Buenos Aires, with the ongoing project with 19 de Abril Community and Immigrate Toba Community from Chaco. Association Proteger has many other projects and great ideas that haven't been carried out yet due to lack of funding. With the help of the Finnish Embassy, Association Proteger built a school in Misiones, since the children did not have a proper build before. The Tequa community of Cuña Piru is settled in Aristóbulo del Valle municipality in Misiones province. The improved people's quality of life is extremely important to eliminate extreme poverty and equality. Education, training, and all branches of knowledge greatly impact on social change. Several indigenous Guarani community from Misiones collaborated with the project. The construction was based on permaculture concepts. Permaculture is a permanent culture which sends long-term sustainable solutions. Permaculture principles are the good use of the land and flows of energy, include bioconstruction and the promotion of social and economic organization. Association Proteger promotes natural construction, sharing the know-how of permaculture as an alternative solution for housing. This slide shows the before and after to the school. On the right side, you can appreciate the school Association Proteger Bill. Also, Misiones, a workshop on BTC brick construction technique, has held in the Tibia Guarani community in Tamandua. Formosa. Along with the Dutch Embassy, Association Proteger built two solar cookers in Formosa. This initiative reduced the pressure on the surrounding forest, preventing deforestation. Indigenous and many non-indigenous communities have serious problems cooking their food due to good scarcity. Solar cookers are also beneficial for human health because of the preventing of the smoke inhalation. 
It was also a strategy to promote access to information on climate change, which allows them to have tools to mitigate extreme poverty. Now I will pass the floor to Sol Garcia. Thanks, Caro. Herb, thank you, panel. The Sinue de community is originally from El Impenetrable Chaqueño, in the province of Chaco. The indigenous community used to be nomad hunters with sustained economy. After several migrations, in 1983, they moved to Buenos Aires province and settled in poor housings located in Dog Sud. The lar lar largest sorry, and most population con petrochemical center in Buenos Aires. Due to the high contamination level of lands in 202, the community gained the community property of five hectares as communal land in Marcos Paz. Two years later, in 204, a public program called the Federal Houses Plan began the construction of houses for the community. The community was finally able to relocate it in 207. They received 20 homes. Currently, 35 families belong to the Sinue de Abril community of Marcos Paz. Since only 20 families have access to housings, the resting 50 families live in precarious both settlements. This is now today's a strong need. The 20 houses hasn't got a holistic design. There was no infrastructure for water, sewers, or clean energy. Currently, they use underwater, they do not trade sewers, and for energy, they use gas cylinder and prepaid energy sources. 17% of the Disneyville community is under 18 years old. They speak Spanish, while the Quam language is not frequently used. It, it is not taught in a school in the province of Buenos Aires, and currently only the caciques still speak the Quam language in the community. The community's basic rights, access to proper healthy service, housings, the healthy and the contaminated environmental are violated. The daily face adversity. Some members of the community make a huge effort to support the community and strengthen solidarity between its members. The cacique transforms his family dinner room as a large room to feed the kids of the community. They prepare 120 meals per week. The food is donated by the group of university, university graduates and the cooking is in charge of the chief family. Another tool they have is art craft sales. The community makes various art crafts which reflect the way connection with the Pachamama and tell us about the ancestral culture. In the photo to the left, you can see some of the art crafts that we brought to share with us, which are also displayed in the table of the left. You may come closer to take a look. As you can see, the crafts are beautiful. But unfortunately, only the chief has the knowledge to make them. A community space to share their culture will be an asset. When the settlement in Marcos Paz, building community center was contemplated, but it remained unfinished. On the right, you can see how it's nowadays. The center is essential to ensure the transfer of a central knowledge. Today, only one person has knowledge of making our craft, and only one person speaks the Quam language in the entire 19 de Abril community. Our dream is finishing the center for the community. We know that we in the public are great dreamers like us. In case you want to collaborate with us and ensure that the Quam language, our craft, and ancestral culture continue in urban communities, the doors are open. Now I will I will pass the floor for Richie. Thank you. No, of Thank you, panel. Hello to the room. Here, here we have uh, the location in Argentina, and then on the map you can see the red square, which is the built walls of 14 by 16 meters, approximately. 
And in our project, we want to show that the use of easily accessible materials can make simple, beautiful, and desirable constructions. It's not possible to prove every part of the building with a new method, but at least we can definitely build some details or some parts of the building which we can show how we can make improvement on living conditions with existing and affordable means. In Marcos Pass, we will look for such methods to finish the building based on the existing walls as a participatory community project. We want to show the making of a clay cast floor, which is a hard, glossy, and nice floor, and then also clay plaster the walls on both sides. Here, a little to also dispel uh, maybe some, some issues with natural materials in, this, uh, in lo local communities. And it also helps that the trends in architecture today is uh, heavily towards natural materials. Uh, we'll also put a grass-covered roof that will work as insulation, and it will look great. And then there'll be a spacious patio around the whole building covered by the roof and a sort of an open public space, actually. We are preparing this project uh, now, and we're looking to launch a crowdfunding campaign uh, still on this year's side, and hopefully then be able to start the building next year. A construction project is a series undertaking whatever size it is, and at the same time, it can be inspiring and incorporate valuable social and cultural aspects in its design and work as a demonstration of useful building methods. A community building project allows us to get closer to the community, to communicate with the community, communicate with the community to plan and to build together. It's also a valuable opportunity to find and explore local materials, natural, reclaimed, hidden or forgotten, and also other available resources and skills that can be used to develop new useful ways to build nice structures. Uh, almost thinking about NDCs here, but it's quite far-fetched. Uh, I forgot all the slides. Uh, so here we see a 3D model based on the existing walls. So we're going to put walls and then a terrace around and it will have a nice roof. And here are some, some images of uh, inspiration. There you have clay walls in a, uh, in a modern building um, meant for, it's a guest house actually, and then there is a grass roof and, and there is a nice covered, uh, covered patio with quite simple materials actually. So this is what you can do with architecture. And here is the vision uh, of this building when it's ready in hopefully one year's time and we'll present it again. And as a final word, we can say that as a volunteer organization, we can make small projects uh, in close collaboration with the community and learn with them. And in a participatory building project, seeing is believing more than perhaps anything else, which is the sort of inspiration and communication that is vital for everybody and that we want to build. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> anyway, thanks a lot to all of you. Uh, thanks a lot because uh, we were very well self-organized at the level of each part that uh, organize this site event. Let me congratulate Olga as the leading person and the leading group that works for to do possible this uh, marriage process and site event. Uh, when we take the final decisions of the running of the site event, we were decided that we no open questions because well, there are three parts, there are one minute, but 
you should know that all the materials that was presented will be in the website of the site event that exists, that is easy to find, and there are the contacts of the members of the groups, and you put uh, take contact with them, and I am sure that they can answer you. So, my final words is not a summary, but it's clear, I think, that uh, how urgent and important is climate action, but also how important is that this action should be fair. Thank you very much to everybody and see you soon.